Okay, welcome folks to another update on the situation in Iceland. I'm geology professor Sean Wilsey. Today's Monday, November 27th. It is about 11 a.m. here Mountain Standard Time. That would make it about 6 p.m. over in Iceland. Um, appreciate you hanging in there with me. I took the weekend off with the holiday here in the States. Uh, I'll be here all this week, so I'll provide updates to you. Maybe not every day, but we'll just see how the situation evolves. Definitely if things happen, I'll be sure to chime in and give you some sort of update. <clears throat> but I'll also be gone, just as a, a note, I'll be gone the 1st, which is this Friday through the 7th. I'll be down in the Mojave, Southern California, Salton Sea area. I've got a canyoneering class, and then I'm going to do some more uh, outdoor geology videos down in that area but definitely if something happens during that interval I'll bring my laptop I'll find a place to hunker down look at some some data and share that with you so uh, if I go a little bit radio silent there for that week just know that I'm out and about but we'll definitely let you know if anything's happening in Iceland so thanks for being with me um, so let's Let's do today what we're going to do is look at some of the data and then I want to have a little bit of a discussion on magma cooling and solidification because I'm seeing a lot of different things out there in the news and on social media and maybe I'll just muddy the waters but I'm hoping that maybe bring a little bit of clarity and I've got some some numbers to share as well. But let's start with um, I want to apologize for the mistake I made on my last update on Friday and if you remember I was getting excited about showing a particular graph and then unbeknownst to me I didn't have my other monitor up that kind of shows me what you're seeing I had no idea that my uh, ugly face was covering the most important part of the graph so I do apologize for that and so let's start with that so let me just give a brief rundown of what I covered uh, maybe you missed it, maybe you pieced it together, maybe you got so sick of looking at me that you just tuned out. But this is, in brief, a graph that shows earthquake numbers, so frequency of earthquakes, and magnitude. So the higher up the y-axis these, these dots are, these stars, that's a larger earthquake. Anything above this line here is a magnitude 4. So these are some 4s and maybe even some 5s in here. And then what this is here is time. So you can see our first big eruptive outbreak in the Reykjanes Peninsula area was in August of, uh, well, actually there was one in 2021. This doesn't go back that far. So we had one in 2021. And then the second big eruption was in August of 2022. Uh, and I, that was an eruption I was able to witness. And so you can see the earthquakes just really spiking up here, um, coinciding with the eruption for a couple of weeks while the eruption took place and then a drop back down to more or less background levels and then if we zoom ahead to more or less a year later uh, this past July 2023 the other eruptive event here just a little bit north and east of that one and you can see the earthquake pattern there and then if we move forward we see the earthquake pattern taking place over the last few weeks in this region of interest we've been focusing on and here I've, I've got the same thing just kind of blown up so there again is that uh, summer 2023 eruptive event in terms of earthquake frequency things dropping back down there's no eruption but seismicity continues and then here's essentially late August these uh, earthquakes increasing in terms of frequency and in terms of magnitude um, and then that the biggest event you know around November 10th or so that was the big crescendo at least so far when we had the greatest number of earthquakes and the largest earthquakes and all the shaking and some damage to infrastructure in and around uh, Grindavik. And so the whole point I was trying to make here was this was interesting to me because it it's similar but it's different, right? These two events here, the last two 2022 and summer 2023 events have very similar earthquake patterns in terms of the duration, the intensity just ramping up immediately and we saw that here a few weeks ago in Iceland. So by all accounts and indicators I would have guessed at that point and I did you know my, my prediction at that point was that um, it was very likely to erupt not 100% certainty but very high um, and then we maintained that for a while and now things have dropped off but we still have quite a bit of earthquake activity happening and this is updated for today November 27th. Um, yeah, but it's a different, we're in a different phase, right? We're in a different phase in a different sort of uh, regime than what we've seen previously. So I wanted to just go over that one more time. And I did that a little bit more lengthy than I wanted to, but you have that from Friday. So I wanted to share that with you. Let's look at the earthquake data 
uh, for today and see what's been going on over the past 24 or so hours. And there's been a bit of an uptick in earthquakes over the last 24 hours, I would say. And we had even a, if I can isolate it in there, there was at least one quake. So the same trend we've been seeing before, concentration up to the north, just east of the power plant uh, near Hagefeld. And if we look for the bigger quakes, we are seeing a few bigger quakes. So in that 24 hour period, four or so, above magnitude two, actually five if you count this one up here, which is probably related, and one of which was a magnitude three. So we did have a magnitude three quake early today. Again, about that five kilometer depth or so, that's kind of typical what we're seeing in terms of the depth of the quakes. Uh, that one's four kilometers, but you can see the general trend there. Um, so we're not out of the woods. I know it feels like, well, there was all this hubbub and then the eruption didn't happen and now people are getting back into town a little bit more, which is great. Um, but as a geologist, I'm I'm not ready to close the chapter on this and move on to the next, the next exciting thing. I, I still think we've got unrest in the area. We've got indicators that suggest that magma is still moving in the subsurface. Whether that, you know, culminates in an eruption or not is, of course, uh, the big question on everyone's minds and of course where it would erupt as well. Um, so there's our data for the last day or so. Let's go to the Met update. So this was just a few hours ago. The Met office in Iceland finally uh, issued an update. They didn't do anything much over the weekend. There wasn't a, well I'm sure they were doing things, but there wasn't an update. Uh, so they're still seeing earthquakes. So just a quick re recap of what they have here. Um, so around 500 earthquakes in a 24 hour period uh, near the magma intrusion. Um, and most of that activity as we highlighted there on the seismic data near Hagefeld and, and the area east of the power plant. Um, they did have one that was a 3.0, we talked about that. And the depth of most greatest activity was around three to five kilometers depth, which we also mentioned. Uh, let's see what else they have here. Um, <clears throat> From the deformation data, looking at the GPS data, the expansion continues at Svartsengi, so that's the power plant, and deformation is still measured close to the magma tunnel. However, no changes were detected in the GPS measurements in connection with the earthquake last night. So they didn't see with that 3.0 anything you know, uh, um, marked that happened with the GPS data. Both seismic and deformation data indicate that magma inflow continues beneath both Smart Sangi and in the center of the magma tunnel. So we're still injecting more magma is coming up from depth and being injected into this system. Uh, the tremors could indicate increased pressure in the corridor. In light of this, an eruption over the magma tunnel is still considered likely. While the inflow of magma continues, greatest risk is around Hagafelt. So we talked about that. And their risk assessment map that they put out four, five, six days ago is, is still valid. They're, they're holding to that. Um, and lastly here, the modeling calculation suggests that part of the magma tunnel, they're calling it tunnel, but the dike, the magma, the big intrusion that runs northeast, southwest, may be wider than first thought. They don't really say exactly what that data is, um, and I guess it's just modeling. So basically, as they're trying to get a better handle on this thing and getting more data over time, the actual width of that dike is larger. They don't say by how much, they don't even estimate how wide it could be. Roughly estimated solidification of the widest part of the corridor could therefore take several months. We'll come back to that at the end of my update today because I want to get, I want to like spend some time on this word, solidification or cooling of magma um, and, and maybe wrestle with that a bit. So uh, let's look at the GPS data. I threw this on the PowerPoint just to make it a little more readable and to make sure my ugly mug was out of the way. So hopefully that's the case here. And so we're just looking at one specific GPS station. This is the one near the power plant. And uh, if you're new to this, basically this is going back to, uh, let's see, this is November, September, or October, September. So this is going back about three months or so. Um, and of course the big, the big unrest began towards the end of October. And so you have three plots here, one that shows the movement of this GPS station north-south, one that shows how much it's moving east to west, and one that shows how much it's moving up and down. So this gives us three-dimensional di three control over how the land is changing in terms of its position over that period of time. So you can see the big movement here is a little bit of movement to the north, and then when the big earthquakes and the most uh, 
significant day around over November 10th, 11th occurred. A big movement uh, to the north of this GPS station. But you can see that that rate has subsided a little bit. So it's not moving as much to the north as what we saw previously. Uh, similarly, when we look at the east-west plot, you can see everything take a dip downward. So that means it's moving not to the east, but instead um, to the west. And then you can see that also kind of tailing off. But the one that probably makes the most sense to you that I want to focus on is the, the up and down motion. So here's uh, everything pretty stable. And then we go into late October and this starts to trend upwards uh, where we use that. And there was other stations showing that same that same signal as well. And the idea there is this magma is intruding into the subsurface. That's causing the ground to basically uplift, you know, a few centimeters basically and bulge. And so some of these GPS stations are moving away from each other or, or away from that that magma intrusion. So you can see going leading up to about November 10th, we had about 10 centimeters, about five inches or so of upward movement. Then the earthquakes is that uh, around November 10th, 11th, that was when the magma quickly moved to the east and started to form and inject into a, a dike, a northe northeast southwest trending dike. And that's what we've seen a lot on the seismic data. So then you can see everything dropping as it as it moved to a different area. But now what we're seeing as we've gone through the last two weeks or so here in November is this trend of this line here, the uplift that's been going on near the power plant has not really abated. It hasn't really decreased much, uh, not really at all. And so this is what at least I'm most concerned about is this is this isn't sustainable. You can't just keep uplifting the area. And furthermore, if you look at how much it's uplifted over the last two weeks, right? So let's say from about the 12th to the 26th there, that's about 20 centimeters of upward movement. And that's much greater than the 10 centimeters of upward movement we had when this whole thing started at the end of October and early November. And so, um, you know, what we if we're, if we're going to put this thing to bed, what we'd like to see is this thing kind of rolling over and flattening out. But until this trend changes, um, I think it's important to really, really stay tuned to what's happening here. So so there's some of the, the GPS data. Um, and I think that's pretty much the, the update for today in terms of just data. Now I want to turn to a little bit of the news going on and we'll look at some of the news reports here in a second. So one thing that's happened is they have changed the um, civil defense, I guess, alert status uh, around Grindavik from emergency, which is the highest level of alert status. That's when we had the full evacuation and all the precautionary measures that were taking place there. They've lowered that now to a danger status. Um, and so without knowing a lot of how they do that in Iceland, we see similar things in the States, and I'm sure every country has their own way of alerting the public. So the whole point is it's dropped down a notch because we're past all that significant earthquake damage. Now realize that can that could move back up. Moving down one notch on that scale doesn't mean that it's going to continue to. It all depends on what the data shows. Um, but that's good news for people in Gudindavik because they've been able to get back into their homes a little bit. They can't stay there permanently, but they can spend more parts of the day there. Uh, I think some of the fishing industry is now operating a bit. I know the Coast Guard ship that they had uh, stationed just off the coast there, they've actually left and gone back to their harbor um, as a, again, as a result of everything dropping a little bit in terms of the, the intensity of, of what was going on there. Uh, the other thing is that the repairs and infrastructure, um, the repairs to the infrastructure in the town have continued. They're ahead of schedule. And so they're making a lot of the houses have at this point hot and cold water. Uh, their their secondary water, wastewater pipes are all intact. They have heat and electricity. Electricity, so that's good news. Uh, there's still some homes that are they're working on those repairs, but for the most part, a lot of the repairs um, have either taken place or are taking place. So that's good news. So let's turn our attention now to this whole idea of. Uh, magma solidification and you know you can even get on some of these news agencies in Iceland and you know again I always wonder how much of this is Icelandic to English translation so I don't want to read too much into this but but I think it's interesting so here's 
uh, a news article from yesterday, Sunday, um, that's, you know, 90% of the magma dike has solidified, the majority of the dike has hardened, uh, and they quote a ge geophysicist, a professor of geophysics, that says, um, you know, basically it's, it's solidified. Let's see, he's, he says that the dike is about two meters wide thick in most places, somewhat wider elsewhere. Um, and that since we've had two weeks that have passed, he thinks 90% of it has solidified, he says. But also he says this doesn't preclude that there's something left and there's still an open way for the magma to go upwards. So um, anyway, so that's one point there, just as a point of note. And then here's the exact same um, news agency, MBL. And this is one from today. And in this one here, let's see what they have here. Um, they talk about, let's see, what did I read in here? There's still a chance of an eruption over the magma tunnel, the dike, while the inflow of magma continues. And solidification, let's see, further modeling calculations have been carried out to estimate the extent of the magma, the dike. Those modeling calculations suggest that part of the magma tunnel may be wider than first thought. That's what we also read on the, the Met Office update. Roughly estimated solidification of the widest part of the cor corridor could take several months. So it's it's confusing, right? Because on one hand, you're seeing like, oh, it's pretty much solidified. That's if you just read the headlines or, or just kind of gloss over things a little bit. The the magma, 90% solidified. Like that's not going to erupt. If you have 90% of your magma body that is solid, and let's talk in a minute about what solid means, then there's no way that that erupts, right? Without a change in the system. Um, and then here we've got something saying, well, it could take several months. So I put together a simple little diagram here, uh, well, a little, a little slide, but let's talk first about what, before I get to that, let's talk about what does solidification mean? Does that mean we can touch it? So when we think of lava flows, we think of like, oh, well, when the lava stops moving and flowing, um, maybe that's when it's solidified, right? When the magma no longer has the ability to move and flow, whether it's underground or at the surface, perhaps that's what we mean when we say solidify. Maybe it means, could I touch it, right? Is it cool to ambient temperatures of whatever surroundings it, it's in? Um, and remember that in my last update, we talked a little bit about this continuum, right? From completely melted rock, 100% liquid to solid, right? And the in-between we have most magmas, which are composed of crystals, and we talk about it being like a crystal mush, right? And I think um, honey is a good analogy. And one of the viewers mentioned this to me. And I've used it in class before. I just didn't think of it in the moment when I was doing my last update. But if you think about honey, when honey is heated up, you know, on the stove in a pot of water or in the microwave, uh, it becomes very fluid, right? Like I've had them run the mistake of trying to um, get a crystallized container of honey to flow more easily, left it in the microwave longer than I intended. And then when I invert that container, holy cow, the honey's just all over the place and I just made a mess. Um, so honey heated up to high temperatures becomes very fluid. But then we've also seen uh, situations where the honey is more crystallized and it doesn't flow at all, right? You can invert the container and the honey is just not coming out. And I think thinking about that as an analogy for magma works pretty well. And so, you know, you've got crystals in between, you got crystals and then in between the crystals you have melt. And as I mentioned in the last update in looking at some papers, I think it was something like uh, you need 40% of it to be melt and 60% to be crystals. You need to have at least that as your threshold um, in order for the magma to erupt because there's eruptible magma, non-eruptible magma. And so today what I want to kind of do is look at um, what, what that actually means. And so what I did here was some really simple, um, just looked up some numbers here, and I'm by no means uh, a math whiz or a geophysicist or anything like that. But let's just go through some facts here. So we know that basaltic magma is about, you know, it ranges a little bit in terms of its temperature, but, and let's keep things in Celsius. It's about 1100 degrees Celsius. It ranges from 1000 to 1200 but let's take something right in the middle there. So the magma that's sitting in the subsurface north of Grindavik is somewhere in that range. Okay, we don't have a thermometer down there. We're not measuring the temperatures directly, um, but from other eruptions in other areas, including Iceland, I think we could say that is a very 
safe assumption. We also know rock is a very good insulator. Rock does a good job of insulating and holding heat. This is why in not just in Iceland, but in Hawaii and other places that erupt basaltic magma, we often get lava flows that can travel for 50 miles or more, like, you know, like 70 kilometers away from the vent because they can travel through tube systems. You can crust over the surface of the lava flow and keep the interior molten part uh, quite hot. And it only loses maybe a degree for every kilometer it moves down slope. It's an incredibly, rock is an incredibly effective insulator. So if we consider that the average geothermal gradient, so if you're not familiar with that, here, let me see if I can help you out here. So basically, if you drill down into the earth anywhere on the planet, it gets hotter. Okay. Now, if you go down into a cave at your local national park, you might say, hey, that doesn't sound right because I went down in a cave and it was cold. I had to wear a jacket. Well, that's because you probably went in the summertime um, and the cave, of course, is insulated. Rock's good insulator. The cave is insulated from the heating of the sun and you were very close to the surface. But if you went actually a kilometer down, like deep mines, uh, diamond mines, if you will, or other places, boreholes where we can penetrate deep into the planet, the average rate at which the Earth heats as you go down every kilometer, it heats up about 25 degrees Celsius. Um, and that's average, right? That's if you're in the middle of Kansas or Sweden, just any place on the planet. But in Iceland, of course, we're looking at a active plate boundary, divergent plate boundary, sitting also on a hot spot. So we know there's a lot more heat in this very geothermally active region. So I looked up and I'll put the references here on the video description. So if you want to look these up, you can. But I looked up Iceland, how high that geothermal gradient is in Iceland. And it's up to, in some of the more geothermal areas, up to about 150 degrees Celsius per kilometer. So is it, if you go down one kilometer from the surface, the ambient temperature of the rocks is about 150 degrees Celsius greater than it would be at the surface. You go down two kilometers, now you're up to 300 degrees Celsius, so on and so forth. And so what I did is just assumed, well, let's just let's just shave this down a little bit, because even though the area, even though we have a power plant close by, um, we're not right over maybe this magma dike isn't right over that geothermal system, at least as far as we know. So I took it down to about 100 degrees Celsius per kilometer. So that what that means then is that all the indicators and all the references and all the news articles tell us that this magma body that's sitting in the subsurface right now in Iceland is down at about five kilometers depth. That's where the earthquakes are happening. That's where we're seeing um, all the indicators happening. Okay, it's, it's pretty close to the surface, but it's not quite there. Five kilometers depth. Well, if you take this rate here, this 100 degrees Celsius per kilometer, and apply it to five kilometers depth, that means that the rocks surrounding this dike are around 500 degrees Celsius. And so you've got this dike that's 1100 degrees Celsius, that's the magma, and then surrounding it is rock that's 500 degrees Celsius. And of course, what's happening is that magma has intruded, as it did a few weeks ago in November, into these cooler rocks. It absolutely crystallized and solidified along the margin, along the contact with those cooler rocks, but the interior is, is still quite a bit insulated. Um, and the the thickness of this dike, as we as we saw in some of the news articles, that is hugely important. And I'll get to that when we turn to this USGS article here in a second. Um, I also found out, and I'll put this reference in the video description as well. And this is something I didn't know, so I'm learning as well. And granted, it's it's one reference, it's one data point, but they stated, and this was studying the eruption on the Isle of Heime in Iceland in 1973, that magma doesn't flow, or what they say is solidifies, that was their definition of solidifies, Does it's not flowing, once you get below about 800 degrees Celsius. So the big question is, well, is this magma that's underneath the ground in Iceland, is it still hot enough to move? And certainly if you're bringing more magma into it, as the GPS data seems to indicate, then I would contend that you very likely have mobile magma. It doesn't mean that it's eruptible magma and you still have the problem of getting it through that last five kilometers to the surface. Um, but I would contend it's, it's at least possibly eruptible. So it, it warrants um, some consideration and some 
um, caution moving forward. So let me show you the USGS article. This was, um, so I don't have any conclusions here. Maybe someone could, maybe there's some math and physics people out there that could play with these numbers and uh, heat equations and thermodynamics and, and show me something that, um, that would point one direction or another. But I found that pretty interesting because we keep thinking in some of these articles from other geologists, and I'm not, I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm just, I'm just taking a little bit different tact with the data um, is if you have, you know, we're not thinking about how hot those rocks really are at depth in this region, right? We have a high geothermal gradient. We're only down five kilometers. And so those rocks surrounding this magma dike aren't like rocks at the surface, you know, at 25 degrees Celsius or, or much lower than that, probably winter time. They're a lot hotter than that, most likely. So, um, so let me take you to, as a final thing, this USGS article and uh, run you through this. And we'll just hit the highlights here. So this is an article from 2019. Um, how do lava flows cool and how long does it take? So they looked at the 2018 eruption in Hawaii. And granted, this is an eruption at the surface. But if anything, an eruption at the surface you think might cool a little bit quicker than magma cooling underground. Uh, so let's look at some of the, the highlights of this thing here. Um, let me see if I can get you through this. So same eruptive temperatures. So maximum temperature of the 2018 eruption was about 1140 degrees Celsius. And let me make this a little bigger. That might help a little bit. Um, okay, when the entire flow cools below about 1000 degrees Celsius, it has solidified, but the interior is still very hot. So that's pretty close to the 800 uh, number I had on that other one there. Uh, arguably the most influential factor determining how fast lava cools is the thickness of the flow. Again, lava is a good and magma is a good insulator. If it's really thick and has large volume, it's going to take a lot longer than if it's thin. Of course, this magma in Iceland is coming up in a dike and dikes tend to be, you know, quote unquote thin. Um, if it's only a few meters wide, that's going to cool a lot quicker than if it's 20 meters wide. Other factors include heat loss from the top and the bottom. Okay, and then these are minor things, but you know, air temperature, rainfall, wind. I would argue those are like way down the list. So if whether it's winter or summer at the surface, and raining or not raining, or windy or not windy, uh, those affect heat loss a little bit, but they're really, really minor compared to some of these other factors. Uh, so then they talk about how it all happens, and I'll I'll put this link in there as well if you want to read through it. Um, but let's get to their actual conclusions here. So, da, 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 da. okay, preliminary analysis, preliminary analysis of the 2018 Lower East Rift Zone eruption flow thickness suggests that the average flow thickness. Now, they're, we're looking in Iceland at a dike that's oriented more or less vertically. They're looking at lava flows that are oriented more or less horizontally. But it's the same thing. Whether it's rocks surrounding it or the ground and the air above it, it's still cooling, right? So thickness is around 10 to 15 meters. Whoops, sorry. 10 to 15 meters or about 33 to 50 feet, which would take roughly eight months to a year and a half to solidify. So, so to get below that, that temperature threshold they mentioned earlier. Now, if you take something a little thicker, so solidification of rows ranging from 20 to 30 meters thick could take about two and a half to six years. And then if you go even thicker, uh, up to 55 meters, that would be exceptionally thick, uh, it could take roughly 20 years to reach a completely solid state. Um, so anyway, I wanted to throw that out there as some interesting data and an interesting perspective. It was mostly a learning opportunity for me. And I just wanted to share that with you. Um, what are my conclusions after kind of digesting all that? Um, definitely the, the magma intrusion is, has as soon as it went into those cooler rocks, relatively cooler rocks, it solidified a little bit. Um, I don't know that I've seen enough data to say that it's 90% solidified. And again, you have to de define the term solidify. Is that meaning complete? Is it mean it completely is hard and it's all solid, meaning all the little molecules are no longer moving? Or does it mean, well, it's just not moving as a, as a body of magma? You still have melt in there, but a lot of it is crystals. Um, not sure, but certainly I think it, it, it was just more of a thought exercise but then obviously with the uplift data near the power plant and the evidence that suggests more magma is being injected into the system um, that can keep things warmer longer right so it's not like this thing this dike formed november 10th 11th 
and since then it's been cooling at a relatively uniform rate if we're injecting more magma into the system that can cause it to increase in temperature over time um, and that was similar to what i showed in that last update i showed you that little kind of graph with the spikes going up and down the magma is injected and it gets hot and then it cools and then it heats and then it cools yeah so i think um for me at least the 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 situation warrants continued monitoring it warrants caution um, obviously i'm hoping for the best situation for all the good people in iceland but we are entering sort of a new a new future a new normal in on the reykjanes peninsula um, we've seen these three eruptions here take place. We're looking at a possible eruption in this region, if not an eruption, just magma intruding. Um, and so what should we do? I mean, they've already started to build structures ahead of it. And so I think in looking forward, if I was a public official or advising a public official, if I was there, I think I would look closely at these systems, we know that these volcanic systems, and I think I have this graphic still here too that might be helpful. Um, make sure I'm not blocking anything. Great. So we know we've got these different volcanic systems that trend northeast southwest. Uh, we're looking at this one here right now. This is the one that was erupting the last over the last three years. They seem to somehow be a little bit related, at least when we look at what they have done historically so when one erupts the others erupt as well not necessarily at the exact same time but during that interval we see them they're all kind of quiet at the same time and they're all intermittently erupting around the same time which is interesting and I don't know that I understand that well enough to to give you a good explanation but but they're somehow related and so based on these last three eruptive events which is very limited right I wish we could go back much further you know thousand multiple th tens of thousands of years into the past and look at how many how this graph would look if we could go further back but we don't have the exposed rock or the subsurface data to really say how these things have erupted over longer periods of time but based on these the last four thousand years or so um you know there's a the little bar at the top right there and are we entering a new phase that's that's sort of the the speculative question that that everyone wants answered because if all these start erupting intermittently over the next few decades or hundreds of years um, what will that mean for Iceland what will it mean for how they plan infrastructure um, I think they need to take a good look at something called land use planning which is just recognizing the hazard areas in your community and then managing that land or that real estate in a very proactive way so that might mean in a in a different context if you have a flood risk maybe we don't put houses in the floodplain maybe we put parks golf courses other facilities trails things people can use but we don't put the valuable infrastructure and we don't put people's homes in in the way in the case of iceland they're looking at implementing defensive barriers which i think is smart right now uh, possibly around the town definitely around the, the power plant um, but looking at how they use their land moving forward as they continue to maybe grow and develop would be important because i think you have other communities and and reykjavik would fit into this too if some of these other systems were to erupt uh, there are lava flows in the past that have come down out of these this volcanic system into some of these communities in and around uh, reykjavik so something to be aware of so i think that's good for today hope you are well if you're in iceland um thinking about you and the situation and I know it's difficult because it's kind of a will it or won't it situation but hang in there um, enjoy the holidays we'll see what happens and what mother nature can throw it throw at us and ultimately like a lot of things in life you just see what hand you're dealt and roll with the punches so until next time have a good one and thanks so much